Okay, here we go. Um, so my role tonight is to um, give you the view of climate change science from uh, the 30,000 foot level. So for international and the national and Pacific Northwest. And I'll be followed by speakers who will address public health issues and the role of forests. So um, let's go with this uh, introductory slide. I show it for two reasons. <clears throat> the top left is, is the atmosphere of the earth, that thin blue line, which is less than one page in a thousand page book. It's tiny. The atmosphere is really thin. And, and the bottom left is my grandson, Jesse, when he was about two. He's walking on the beach in Santa Monica, Southern California. And before he retires, that's all gone. That's underwater. California stands to lose a third to half of all of its beaches due to sea level rise in his lifetime. He doesn't know this yet. Okay, wait a minute. How do I advance? Uh-oh. There's a little arrow down in the bottom left hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I see it. There we go. Okay. Um, I've had, after the long in introduction, I don't need to say much more about myself. I didn't choose climate change. I think that climate change chose me. I was a physical chemist. I liked basic research. I actually went out into outer space and studied the chemistry of interstellar space, looking for the origin of, of, of chemistry that led to the origin of life on Earth and elsewhere. Uh, and then I fell into the stratosphere and then I fell into the oceans. So I've kind of wandered around through, through uh, Earth systems and carbon cycle and uh, have ended up in retirement talking to groups like this about climate change science. So I'll try to keep it very clear when I'm talking about the established consensus climate change science. Maybe at the end, I'll give you a little bit more of my heart and my values when we come to the questions about what can I do. So here's the, here's the outline. I'm going to talk about the, the global understanding of climate change science from the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, as it was said. I helped uh, author the carbon cycle chapter of the first such report in 1990. They come out about every five or seven years. So 1990, 1995, 2001, 2007, 2013. We're due for another one, but COVID has probably delayed that for a year or so. We'll see. Uh, and then at the national level, uh, every four years, uh, the U.S. government is required by law to produce a national climate assessment. Again, well, that's due uh, a year or so from now. Let's hope that it's not delayed too much and that the science is accurate there. Uh, the latest one was 2018, and the Climate Science Special Report, uh, CSSR, uh, is the summary of the physical science in that report. Again, these reports now are a year or two late, which means that it's about five years behind the science because it takes a while for the scientific consensus to be represented in these documents and a while for these documents to come out. And then finally, in the Pacific Northwest, here in Washington State, we have the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington, which produces reports on the impact uh, and adaptation of the state and the Northwest to, climate, to the coming climate change. Now, um, in general, I agree with, with the reports that they produce. There's one area that I'll bring up about sea level rise where I, where I disagree with them. And then finally, what can I do? All this doomsday stuff, what can I do? We'll reserve that for the question period and, and uh, please put your question in the chat box so that we can have this discussion toward the end. Here we go, let's see. I'm not gonna go over this in, in detail, it's just that this has been a horrible year for climate change, horrible year. It may turn out to be the warmest year ever in, in the record. Certainly September was the warmest September ever, and, and we're gonna be either the second warmest year ever or the warmest year, we don't know yet. Even though the sun is not very bright, we're in a solar minimum, and we're in a La Nina, not El Nino. So if we, if we set a record this year, watch out in five years when we have solar max and an El Nino. Fires are burning in the Amazon. One quarter of the Pantanal, which is a, a swampy area south of the Amazon, has been burned up. Fires are not just on the west coast of the US, they're around the world. And Portland set a record for the worst air quality in the world, worse than Beijing, worse than Delhi in September. I'll show you the figure there. Uh, because of the warming in the Arctic has been two or three times more than the global average, the, peat, the permafrost is melting, releasing CO2 and methane, which is amplifying feedback on the warming which is coming. There are some estimates that the climate sensitivity is actually higher 
than we thought, which means that for a given amount of CO2, we may get war more warming than we thought we would. And stopping at 1.5, my, my personal view is that that's in the rearview mirror. I think we'd be very lucky to stop at two degrees C, really hard. Meeting the Paris obligations, as stated so far, would mean a world of three degrees warmer, but in fact, we're not, we're not meeting that. And we're heading for a world of four degrees C at the present time. So we've, uh, for example, we've had a terrible hurricane season in the Atlantic. Uh, we've gone through the alphabet. We're now into the Greek letters and hurricane Epsilon is approaching Bermuda uh, today. Uh, because of the COVID crisis, COVID pandemic, uh, global emissions actually were uh, down quite a bit in the year 2020, maybe 7% for the year. Here's the challenge. We have to do that every year from now on for our generation. If we wanna to get uh, to a world where we are uh, carbon neutral by uh, 2050, that's the challenge. Here we go, let's see. Uh, um, just to show you, there was San Francisco at noon in September. That was noon, midday, look at that. And the Paradise Fire, which burned up the town of Paradise and killed so many people the year before. And on the right-hand side, look at the smoke plumes. That's black carbon, that's smoke for three days in September when uh, California, Oregon, and Washington were burning up. You can see the smoke plume first in the, in the west and then moving east and then moving off the east coast over Europe and actually circling the globe. Oops, don't want that. Um, and this year, because the ocean temperatures are so high, we actually had more than one or two or three or four, we had five tropical storms, hurricanes in the Atlantic at the same time. This is almost never happens. 2005, we almost did this, but we're gonna beat 2005 in a record for the total number of named storms, the total number of storms coming ashore in the United States. Here's uh, in the upper left, the actual uh, temperature record for the globe by NOAA, uh, the uh, European Center, and the Japanese. And you can see there's no disagreement now about the actual temperature record for the globe, surface temperature record uh, from uh, 1850 to the present time. And notice since about 1975, the curve is bending up. We're not slowing it, we're not bending the curve, we're actually warming faster and faster. And in the lower right, is the actual record of carbon dioxide from uh, the NOAA uh, measurements on the Mauna Loa Observatory. This is an observatory uh, where CO2 measurements were begun in 1958 by Dave Keeling and continued now by his son, Ralph Keeling. So side by side, the Scripps measurement of CO2 minute by minute is together with the NOAA measurements of CO2. And you can see again that uh, there's no bending. The curve is not, we're not bending the curve. In fact, if anything, the curve is, is bending up. We've got to stop this increase. <clears throat> so um, the basic consensus on human-caused climate change is no longer a question. <clears throat> there, there's a political question, but it's no longer a scientific question. So I, I quote uh, Gina McCarthy, former head of EPA down below. It says, human-caused climate change is now has a greater degree of scientific certainty, whoops, sorry, a greater degree of scientific certainty than the long accepted fact that smoking cigarettes causes cancer. <clears throat> and if you were watching the uh, uh, Senate hearings for uh, uh, Supreme Court nominee, Judge Amy Barrett, she said, well, I accept that smoking causes cancer. It's on the pack of every cigarette, but you know, uh, this climate, man-made climate change, that's still uh, controversial. No, Amy, it's not. There's a political controversy but not a scientific one. I'm not making a political statement here. I'm standing up for the science. You're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. So this is a figure just uh, from the latest IPCC report um, to show that, uh, sorry, excuse me. I'm trying to move the people up. Okay, so we've moved from, uh, the early report said, uh, more likely than not, and the next report said pretty likely, and the next report said very likely. In 2013 and 14, we said it is now extremely likely, more than 95% confidence that human activity is causing the warming. And if you ask the active climate scientists in the field now, 
we're at the 95, 97, 98, 99% confidence that yes, it's happening, and yes, we are doing it. So let's get beyond that. Let's talk about what we do about it, not about whether it's happening. And then at the national level, the National uh, Climate Assessment, which is issued every four years by uh, federal law, the last report was in 2018, and the physical science is summarized in the Climate Science Special Report. Here's a, here's a figure from that report, which just shows a picture of uh, the pattern of warming for the last 50 years. Notice the pattern of warming. The pattern shows that the warming is greater in the northern hemisphere than the summer, just northern hemisphere greater than the southern hemisphere, as the models predict. The warming is greater over the land than over the ocean. The warming is greater uh, at high latitude than near the equator. And significantly, the warming is not shown here. The warming is greater in the winter than the summer, and the warming is greater at night than during the day. Only greenhouse gases do this. Nothing else, not volcanoes, not El Nino, not solar variability, only greenhouse gases produce this particular pattern of warming. And here's a figure that says, human-caused climate change is responsible for almost all of, of the extra heat that the, Earth, the Earth's radiative imbalance. Solar is there, it's tiny. Volcanoes are there, they're tiny and negative. Volcanic eruptions cause cooling, not warming. So it's not solar, it's not volcanic, it's human cause. Get over it, that's done. Let's move on to what we can do about it. So here's a figure, uh, two figures, uh, the upper right, I'm sorry, having trouble with this. Uh, let's see. Uh, um, the lower figure shows actual measured carbon dioxide in ice cores from the South Pole for the last thousand years. I'm uh, sorry, 800,000 years, almost uh, a million years. And you can see the CO2 varies between warm periods, about 270, and cold periods, about a little less than 200 parts per million. And now we're above 400. We're at 420 and running away. When was the last time CO2 was that high? There were no humans on the planet. Our species had not evolved. In fact, there was no homo, genus homo. There were no Neanderthals, no cavemen. We've got to go back to the chimps. When we split from the chimps millions of years ago, three, four, five, six million years ago, to find any level of CO2 like we have today, it's far beyond human experience. And then the upper curve shows actually the, the level of CO2, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm having trouble seeing this on my, there we go, let me go back, uh, there we go back, one. Uh, it's, it's trying to show you that uh, over the last 10,000 years, since we came out of the last ice age, established cities and agriculture, we're now uh, warmer than we've ever been. And where we're going is beyond the human experience. Whether we have two or three or four or five degrees uh, centigrade, double that for Fahrenheit of warming, it's not, in our, it's not in our history, it's not in our culture, it's not in our experience. That's where we're headed, unless we change. So here's, here's actual data. The, the distribution of temperature for the Northern Hemisphere, summer temperature, in the top panel is the, is the distribution for the uh, baseline period of 1950 to 80, showing uh, the normal period, some hot times and some cold times. And the bottom figure shows what's happened in the, in the decade of 2005 to 15. It's all moved to the hotter side. Hot is the new normal. There's very many fewer cold days and many, many more extreme warm days. Is this the new normal? No, there's no new normal. There's no normal at all. It's gonna keep getting worse until we stop putting CO2 in the air. In fact, we've got to suck the CO2 back out. That's another problem. So this shows, uh, look at the right-hand side for high emission scenario to the end of the century, the lower right panel shows uh, by the end of the century, the average temperature is going to be many, many degrees warmer. You can find Seattle, Pacific Northwest, somewhere here, and you'll find that it's uh, four, six, eight degrees Fahrenheit warmer than today. That's what our future looks like, it, as long as we stay on this high CO2 emission scenario. I know I'm going very fast. This is all being recorded, 
and I'm happy to make these figures available to anyone who wants them. This is just a figure that shows you the, the extent of the forest fires that we've had um, in Santa Rosa in the 2017 and, and, and this summer in California and Oregon especially. Again, we lost our blue sky here in the Northwest and people with breathing uh, problems, health issues, certainly experienced that in September here. And then uh, in addition, the forests when they're dry and attacked by beetles are hot and dry and, and dead trees are burn much more easily. This figure shows uh, what we might expect in terms of changes in rainfall on a global basis. Notice that we're kind of up here, um, we might get more rain probably in the winter and less rain in the summer, but notice the subtropics. Notice the regions of, 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 of sorry, the Mediterranean region, um, Southern uh, Africa, the Amazon, uh, Mexico and Central America and Australia. All these areas are predicted to dry out and the extent of drying depends upon the extent of warming. More rainfall at high latitude, Northern hemisphere, less rainfall in the subtropics. A lot of people live in these subtropical regions. Where are they gonna go? How are they gonna grow their food? So it's already begun. Here's a map, a drought map from August for the US. The, the drought in the Western and Southwestern US is now part of, a, of a, a mega drought pattern, which has begun, this drought mega one for decades, and will cause many people to leave. Where will they go? They'll go somewhere where they can live, have water, and grow their food. Chronic long duration hydrological drought is increasingly possible before 2100, says the Climate Science Special Report. Um, this is a figure showing uh, a region of uh, Antarctica, West Antarctic ice sheet, uh, called the Pine Island Glacier and the Thwaites Glacier. Uh, these uh, have perhaps have already uh, become destabilized, uh, and uh, they will put their they will uh, uncork the bottle and and uh, when that ice goes into the sea, we will have many meters of sea level rise. Now, it not, may not happen in your lifetime, but as this report says, a global mean sea level rise exceeding eight feet by 2100 is physically possible, although that probability cannot be currently assessed. That was the report, uh, Climate Science Special Report in 2018. Uh, and so for the purposes of policy planning, uh, looking at six or seven feet of sea level rise is what we need to do. Don't plan for two or three feet. Don't, don't buy that cottage at the high tide line. It's not going to be safe. Uh, this is uh, again from the uh, Climate Science Special Report. Um, a rise of as much as eight feet by 2100 cannot be ruled out. We don't buy insurance for the most likely case. We buy insurance for the high impact improbable case. And I'm arguing that sea level in the Northwest here is such a low probability but high impact case. Another thing that's happening is that um, maybe a third of the CO2 we put in the air is dissolving and going into the surface ocean. CO2 plus H2O is H2CO3, carbonic acid. It's an acidic gas. And so the oceans are being acidified. Ocean acidification is happening globally. We have the measurements. We can actually measure the changing acidity of the ocean. It's happening faster than it's ever happened in the last 66 million years, since the end of the dinosaurs. That's how fast the CO2 is changing the pH, the acidity, alkalinity of the world ocean. So a good summary of what's happening in the world ocean, the oceans are becoming hot, sour, breathless, toxic, and higher. Hot because of the more than 90% of the greenhouse imbalance of heat is going into the ocean. Sour because of becoming more acidic. Breathless because the warmer water holds less oxygen. Toxic because this warmer water is encouraging toxic algal blooms even on our coast. And higher because sea level is rising. It's rising more than an inch every 10 years now. What if it starts rising an inch every year? Then you're looking at four, six, seven feet of sea level rise. I, I like to snorkel. I've been to Hawaii. I've been to the Great Barrier Reef. Half of the Great Barrier Reef is dead half gone already, and we stand to lose two thirds of the coral reef or 99% of it or more. And one quarter of all the marine life is associated with coral reefs. These are the tropical forests of the ocean. We must not let this happen. So going to the Pacific Northwest, I'm going very quickly now because my time is up. Um, 
uh, major effects in the Northwest, warmer temperatures, reduced snowpack, more extreme weather, and rising sea level. These are the reports from the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington, which become essentially the documents about the state of climate for our state. Uh, I, I refer you to these documents to read about the impacts of climate change on Puget Sound and on the region in general, uh, well-written, uh, scientifically accurate. Uh, there's the smoke in Portland in, in uh, September of this year. And here's the uh, uh, most active forest fire year on the West Coast. And we lose our blue skies. When I was younger here in the Northwest, we had blue skies in the summer. We didn't have that smoke. The other thing that's happening off our coast is warm water. The blob, we call it. The blob was here in 14 and 15, and now it's come back. So warm water off our coast uh, changes uh, the uh, uh, life cycle uh, for fishery and for uh, marine birds. And we know it's due to human activity. So uh, when uh, Talakwa or Talakwa lost her baby in 2018, she grieved with her sisters. And now she has a new baby, uh, the boy, and here he is. So we, we have to be concerned about the southern resident orcas, who they depend upon salmon, and they're not having enough to eat. And uh, um, other years, in recent years, have been terrible for the return of, for example, sockeye salmon in, in the Columbia. Horrible, horrible year in 2015. Half the fish couldn't go up the river, too warm. Other invasive uh, species are here as well. I won't have time to talk about this. I'm going to focus more on uh, sea level rise in my final remarks that uh, the sea level rise impact here in, in Washington would be about the same as California and worse than Oregon. Not as bad as Louisiana or Florida or South Carolina, but uh, sea level rise in Washington could displace hundreds of thousands of people from our coastal region. And for the United States as a whole, we may have as many as 10 or 13 million people who would have their homes inundated if we had six feet of sea level rise in this century. Now, is that for sure it's going to happen? No. What are the odds of that happening? It's not one in a million. It's not one in a thousand. It might be 5%. It might be 5%. And so here is the uh, Climate Impacts Group, their uh, report written by Ian Miller and others. Uh, looking for sea level rise in our coastal region. I think it's a little too low. I think it's too uh, reassuring. I think uh, we ought to plan for something much worse than that. And uh, Union of Concerned Scientists and the state of California, for example, say uh, that for policy planning purposes, we have to think about six feet of sea level rise, not two, not three, not, not four, but six. What does that mean? Well, we may have a 5% chance of sea level rise of seven feet in this uh, century. Now, again, it's very hard to calculate this, but if you just ask the experts in the field, that's called expert elicitation, we're talking about a 5% chance of that. And so here's what happens. I love the tulips. I love the Skagit. All the shaded area is gone. If we have six feet of sea level rise, bye-bye tulips, bye-bye Laconer. It's a question of time. It may happen in the lifetime of children born today. It may happen a generation after that. But none of those curves are coming down. Some of the cities that most can risk in our state, Conway, Edison, La Conner, Whidbey Island Station, et cetera. So sea level rises in our future. We need to prepare for it. We need to slow it down if we can. Climate impacts will be bad for people in the Southeast, not so bad for upper tier state, uh, states. And so these people, economically suffering, climate refugees, where are they going to go? They, uh, many of them will be coming here. Are we planning for a mass migration of climate refugees? We need to be. On a global scale, who's putting it up there? The people burning the fossil fuels are not the ones that are impacted. This is the direct health impacts uh, uh, food, of food and, and disease. The people impacted by, by the burning uh, are not the ones that are doing the burning. I'm going to go too quickly now, uh, just to get on through this. Uh, yes, China emits more than we do now. They passed us oh, 10 years ago. But the climate impacts is from the cumulative emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. It's not China. It's the US and Western Europe. It's everything we've ever put up is still up there. So the cumulative impacts of CO2 emissions per person 
The U.S. is number one, number one. It's not China. And so what do we have to do to get back down? We've got to stop. If you want to stop at two or three degrees, you've got to stop right now and start reducing the emissions. In fact, later in this century, you've got to go negative. What does that mean? That means sucking it back out. Yes, trees will help. And you hear something about uh, reforestation later in this talk. Uh, but if we don't, we're headed for a very, very different future. So uh, we've got to uh, cut it in half in 10 years. And uh, sorry, sorry. And then cut that in half in 10 years, and then cut that in half in 10 years. And if we do that, we have a chance to be a carbon neutral by 2050. But we have to stop all tropical deforestation, and we have to uh, have a, a means to uh, withdraw CO2 from the atmosphere. Then we have a chance as a world to get to carbon neutrality by 2050. Can we do it? I don't know. I sure hope we, ha we have to try. We have to try. So I'm going to stop there. Let's see. Uh, I'm not even going to have time to show this. So I like Kate Marvel's uh, statement. Climate change isn't a cliff we fall off. It's a slope we slide down. Every bit makes it worse. No matter how far down the slope we go, there's never a reason to give up fighting. So two degrees is better than three degrees. Three degrees is better than four degrees. Four degrees is better than five degrees. We've got to stop the thing. So I like this uh, to end with this slide, and we'll come back with your questions later. Here's, here's me standing up there talking about uh, renewables, clean water, healthy children, et cetera. And here's a guy in the background saying, uh, what if it's all a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? Well, let's do it. Let's create that better world for nothing. Thank you.